The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Hey, how you guys doing? Um, so I don't know, as Nikolai said, thanks for inviting us. It's a real pleasure to come here and have a chance to talk to everybody today. Um, I brought one of my uh, senior managers who oversees the uh, network and security areas, Dave Laporte, who's um, gonna talk about some of the more tactical details of what we do. I'll kind of talk about the high level. Um, feel free to ask questions at any time. It's really, it's your opportunity to ask anything you're curious about, so there's no decorum in terms of what you guys can ask or at any time feel free to um, engage. And uh, so I think I was sitting where you guys were sitting, I don't know, is it almost 20 years ago now? <laughs> so Nikolai and I were a lot younger then and I was probably a lot thinner by then and uh, had a little bit more hair. Um, you know, one of the nice things about overseeing uh, MIT's uh, infrastructure and operations area is you can see all sorts of interesting things. And uh, some of the things we'll talk about is a lot of what we do is dealing with uh, interesting problems. And, uh, you know, there's no shortage of things um, in an environment like MIT's. I think what's really remarkable is, you know, we run an open network, um, which is a little bit of a good thing and a bad thing. Um, we don't have you know, a broad campus firewall for the most part and everything's pretty much open. If you guys wanna run a computer in your dorm, right here in the lecture hall or anything else, you have pretty much unfettered access to the uh, internet, which is, you know, compared to other schools, actually fairly unusual. Um, you, know, you may not realize that as you sit here, but that's not the norm. And uh, you know, that brings with it a whole slew of challenges um, in terms of keeping things secure. So you know, um, pretty much we're wide open to the world. And that means anybody anywhere from whatever country, from whatever part of the planet, uh, if they wanna reach out and touch your device sitting here in this room as you're sitting here today, whether it's your phone in your pocket or your laptop that you're typing on when you're sitting here, they can do that. There's nothing to prevent them from doing that, right? And um, that's kinda scary, right? So, you know, we did an experiment a couple years ago and uh, we put a, you know, just took a device out of a box, brand new, uh, brand new Apple laptop and just plugged it in, uh, registered it for DHCP, and just left it there sitting there and for 24 hours. And uh, we left TCP dump running to just take an inventory of what was coming into the machine for a 24-hour period, just to see what we would see. And then we combined that with, hey, let's go and graph all of the uh, various IPs using GeoIP lookup and graph them and put them on Google Earth and see what that looks like, all right? And for one 24-hour period for an inauspicious or relevant host, which is just you know, publicly registered for the internet, it received connections from every country on the earth except for two. In one 24-hour period, a, one host for every country except for two. That's pretty startling, right? So you wanna take a guess at the two countries that were not trying to connect to this machine were? Anyone? North Korea's one, good. No, China was very actively uh, represented. <laughs> so it might have been the military part, I don't know, but you know, certainly uh, was very uh, actively represented, so it wasn't them. That's right, Antarctica, it's very good. So you get the gold star for today, it's excellent. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, so for one 24 hour period, you're seeing yourself subjected to potential attacks, threats, malware, anything else, everywhere, for one host. And the entire MIT campus right now compromises about, I'd say 150,000 different devices. And so if you do the math, right, you can do that out, right? We're good at math here at MIT. Um, that's a lot, that's a lot of threats, right? And you know, that happens all day, every day, right? And that's pretty scary. And you, you wanna combine that with something else to make you a little bit more scared? So Dave and I were sitting in a meeting I don't know, a couple weeks, uh, a couple months ago. Uh, this is kind of a follow-up as to a power outage that happened. And you here for the big power outage a year ago or a year and a half ago? It's an exciting time, right? <laughs> um, I was here for the big power outage about 20 years ago when the entire city of Cambridge was starting. Now that was cool. Um, except it was about 100 degrees. So you know it was a good time to go over to Boston and see a movie in the movie theater. Um, but one thing that came out of it that was really interesting to us, and I don't know, let's talk about it for a second, but facilities department comes to us and says, you know, 
this has been really bad, this power outage. We've really had to spend the last four or five months going across the campus and reprogramming all these devices. Like, okay, well, you know, they must have some, you know, SCADA systems that are connected to their air conditioning or to the lights in the room, the doors, things like that, right? You would think they do, it's MIT, makes sense. Um, so sure, and they said, you know, you would imagine they're secure, right? You know, we'll talk about that in a second. And so, you know, we figured that was pretty straightforward. And they said one of the things they had a problem with was their devices keep getting knocked, get knocked off the net, they have these issues. And the more you start talking to them, you peel back the layers of the onion, you're like, what do you mean your devices are on the net? So, well, yeah, our devices are on the net. Oh, you must have some secure proprietary control system or control network. And they kind of looked at us at a blank look and were like, ah, uh, I think that's what it is. That's what the vendor told us. And, you know, this brings up one of the interesting things of the Internet of Things or the era we're moving into is, you know, for the most part when, you know, I was younger, people using the Internet had to be fairly sophisticated, right? You had to fairly know something that you were doing. Uh, today, everybody's using it. And, you know, the bar to use it used to be, you know, when you ride the roller coasters, thou shalt be this tall if you're going to ride this ride. It's gotten a lot lower, all right? And uh, so through the conversation with them, we find out that they have pretty much everything you could think of connected to the Internet. Everything. Um, one of the things that was interesting, MIT launched an energy initiative, uh, I don't know, five, seven years ago when Susan Hockfield was here as president. And one of the things facilities did was really grow the Internet of Things on campus to create these dynamically managed buildings. So when a classroom isn't in use, lights will go off, the heating will change, you know, they're doing things like that, you know, across the campus. They deployed a gigantic control network. Gigantic. It's a, actually bigger than our own campus internet at some level. So their control network compromises, I think, 400,000 different points that they're monitoring across the campus. Over 50 to 75 to 100,000 devices. And so the next question you ask yourself, or Dave asks, you know, with big, bright, wide eyes, is, uh, how are you guys securing that? They're like, well, we called you guys up and we ordered a jack. And they put it in and we got an IP address by going to your web form to, you know, request an IP. We requested IP and it's working. And, you know, we're sitting there going, yeah, this whole open internet thing. How are you guys securing that? And the, and the question, of course, which is, you know, when, <laughs> you know, your blood pressure goes up a little bit was, well, it's secure because you guys take care of that. So, you know, the security is already taken care of. And, you know, our look on our face is a little bit like, what do you mean by secure? Well, like, you have a corporate firewall, so that's dealt with and everything's secure. <laughs> and, you know, uh, my next question was, can you show me where that is? Because <laughs> I don't know. And, um, you know, of course, the response was, well, everybody does. And, of course, we're a little different going back to the point I made earlier. We operate a fairly open environment. And we've always believed, and it's MIT's philosophy, that we believe in defense and security across the stack. You don't want to depend on any one part of the infrastructure to implement security. It's something you have to do at every layer, right? You don't do it just at the infrastructure. You do it at the application. You do it all sorts of places. That's not how these systems, you know, on the Internet of Things or the SCADA side get built, right? That's kind of scary. And uh, so one of the things we're seeing here that we have to deal with is in addition to dealing with folks like yourself who are doing all sorts of creative and inventive things, you know, to keep people like Dave and I up at night, um, you know, the Internet is becoming this utility that's used for all sorts of things, you know, across the campus. And it's really changed the dynamics that we have to worry about in terms of threats, security issues, all sorts of things. So now, you know, when the internet used to go down or have an issue, you know, when we were students, it was an inconvenience, right? It was, you know, it was annoying. Um, in this most recent, you know, types of events, when the internet goes down, people's air conditioning stops working. The heat doesn't work. You know, so the, th the threats have really changed. And so for us, you know, we deal with this whole broad spectrum of things where we operate as a service provider for the campus, you know, providing services to folks like yourself, but we also provide services to all sorts of things. And, you know, when you combine that with our open network philosophy, it creates a lot of interesting uh, use cases and threats that we have to worry about on a pretty persistent basis. Um, and people's expectation of how the Internet is going to work, and one of the things that's, you know, also been eye-opening is these systems kind of grow. When the power outage happened, one of the first questions they had to add was, why did the network stop working? 
And we, our response was, well, it, it, there was no power. And they said, well, that comes from the batteries on the phone system, right? It's all taken care of. I'm like, no, it doesn't. That's analog phone technology. Like, well, what's the difference? Well, as you guys know a lot, right? <laughs> so, but there's this expectation that these things operate like a utility service, whether it's at the security level, the resiliency level, or everything else. And you know, I love the fat pe folks that have so much confidence that these things are being dealt with at that level, but that's a big gap from where we are you know, right now. And so you know, we spend a majority of our time trying to you know, keep the campus environment running, uh, keep everything as secure as we can. And Dave will talk about that in a little bit more detail and give you some interesting stories about the kinds of things we deal with. But it's, 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 a, it's an interesting job, right? And uh, you know, we see all sorts of interesting things. And I think the problems just get harder and harder. And I think the thing is, is the internet kind of expands. And the internet of things is a big buzzword. How many of you have heard of that before today? You guys have gone to a Cisco website or something where they're trying to sell you expensive equipment. Um, but this whole phenomenon where everything is internet or uh, you know, IP enabled, that's here. And unfortunately, a lot of the people writing these systems are not as uh, studious as people who went to MIT. <laughs> um, they create all sorts of interesting problems. So I think for us, the real challenge is when you look at security kind of from a systemic level, um, it's just there's a thousand moving pieces, and it's really, really hard. And even for us, you know, we have to deal with service providers you know, on the external side. We have to deal with our own customers. We have to deal with application providers. It's this very broad ecosystem of issues you have to worry about to provide security holistically. And the challenge is pretty daunting at times. And um, so from that point, I guess I'll have Dave talk a little bit about a couple of things we've seen. Do you guys have any questions before Dave gets set up that you'd like to ask about anything in particular? Anything? Okay. Come on up, Dave. Yeah. Uh, have you seen any APC campaigns attacking MIT directly? Yes. Yes. Um, I think what's interesting is one of the things we're seeing uh, more of is, you know, one of the things Dave will talk about now that's really hard is visibility. Um, you know, if I talk, told you the story about the one laptop, and we have 100,000 or 100, you know, 150,000 devices, and also if you think of the number of IP addresses MIT has as having a slash eight network, seeing, finding the needle in the haystack is really hard. So these APTs, which we do have, um, Finding that noise or that activity going on within this broad stream of traffic is very difficult. One of the things we've had help with is some of the tools we have now are a little bit more advanced. We'll talk about that in a minute. But one of the things we also see now is law enforcement's help um, from the federal side or from other parts where they reach out to you um, to give you guidance in some of these things where they see things like that, um, which is very helpful. <laughs> um, but with, you know, operating in an open environment, we've had a few of these where I've been really surprised that they were going on, but they do. And I think one of the other things we're going to see in the future is today, you know, we do a lot of research activity here at MIT. It's one of our primary missions. The federal funding sources that provide for that research don't really have a lot of rules about, you know, how you do it. Um, as you'll find out as you go into your grad student life and other things, when you get federal grants, for research, whether it's private or you know, primarily from the government, whether it's the NSF or the NIH, their requirements are pretty vague. Right? They'll say one of the things we're dealing with lately is they'll say, we have a data requirement in the grant that says you should have a data policy about all the data you generate from your grant is going to be preserved. All right? And the way MIT does that is it says to the PI, that's great. We have this requirement. You know, are you going to take care of it? They say, sure, I'll take care of it. Sign the document. Right? Compliance with that, what they did with it, it's left to the discretion of the primary investigator. So if the government was ever to come to us and say, hey, where's the data? Just point to the faculty member and say, hey, talk to him. Uh, but one of the things we're also seeing is the government saying, hey, look, you know, we're investing a lot of money in doing this research. We don't want to spend all the money and give the research to another country in some cases, right? Um, so what we've seen on the legislative side or some of the federal funding agency side is a lot of them are coming to us and saying, you know, is an industry I think we need some more security requirements for this. And I think what's hard for us is, you know, MIT's very much an incubator. You know, we have an you know, incredible number of brilliant people. Um, and, you know, for the administration at large, we serve as sort of a hosting company, right? We incubate that activity. We provide them lab spaces or internet connectivity or all sorts of things. Um, but for the most part, it's a fairly federated environment, right? People have a level of autonomy. And so 
you know, as you have more requirements coming up, you know, and fly those across the institution would be very hard. But to go back to the APT thing, you know, there's a tremendous amount of intellectual capital here. Tremendous amount of interesting things going on here that um, folks outside this country are very interested in. And, you know, I don't know if you guys know this, what country do you think is responsible for more intellectual property theft than most any place in the world? You want to take a guess? That's a dangerous proposition. No, 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 but I'm serious. I mean, one of the ones that, you, it's, it was really shocking to me because I never expected it. And that's not to say they're doing that here, but, you know, globally. Does anyone want to take a, a hint? Come on, somebody. Nobody? China? Who? It's not China. Russia? Nope. Russia? Nope. Nope. <laughs> You're getting close, though, but it's in Europe. France. France. Sorry. What was it? France. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you wouldn't expect that, right? But I have a bunch of folks who work in the um, industry side, commercial sector, you know, security area. And one of the things they have to worry about is companies, you know, some of them located in this geography, is that's one of their biggest threats, well, which is kind of surprising, right? You would think it's Iran, you would think it's, you know, all sorts of other places, no. And um, so, you know, it's, it's interesting, right? You wouldn't expect that. And um, that's not to say the U.S. isn't doing it too, let's be honest, right? We're just doing it better, not getting caught properly. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, needless to say, yeah, you know, that's one of the more interesting things. Other questions? You ready, Dave? Yeah. What sorts of things do you log on MIT's network? <laughs> <laughs> we turn the camera off? No. Um, we, uh, we log, you know, some fairly interesting things. Um, you know, I'd say for the most part, I'll be honest with you, um, authentication requests we log. So when you log in through Kerberos, you log in through Active Directory, um, you log in through Touchstone, through our SAML IDP, those things get logged. Um, we have very detailed uh, retention policies, which we're happy to share with you. It's published. Uh, you know, if you access a web page, um, if you check in, you know, you know to read your email, uh, things like that. And uh, one of the problems we have is correlating all that information can be fairly hard. You know, it's a lot of different sources. Uh, Dave will talk about that a little bit. Um, but that's pretty much what we do. We try to keep our retention period uh, usually within 30 days. Uh, totally. So uh, MIT runs its own CA, right? There's a root MIT certificate. Yes. Private key, like that. Mm -hmm. Where do you guys keep that private key? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. Do you use like tamper resistant hardware or something like that, or do you just put it on a computer somewhere or in Linux waiting to be happening? Well, wow. Um, good question. Yes, we do run our own CA. We've been running our own CA since um, the, the late 1990s. Uh, so, you know, in a whole world where the web was doing uh, authentication using, you know, username password over SSL, you know, I think MIT was fairly progressive there doing PKI. Now, I don't know, you guys are a little bit younger, but back in 19, uh, I don't know, 98, they were telling me the year of PKI is just about here. It's going to be next year. And we've been saying that for about 20 years. So um, hopefully it's soon. So in terms of how it's stored, um, tamper-resistant hardware, that's a nice idea. I like that. That, 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 that would be great. <laughs> um, that's not how we're doing it. Uh, so the CAs usually do it through using um, USB keys or other, or other tokens that have you know, fairly involved uh, protocols where you can only access information off once it's been written. Um, in terms of you can send something up for signature, but you can't actually get the key off, right? So they have a whole uh, way of doing that. Um, to be honest, the CA server we're using now was written before any of those markets kind of existed. And uh, so we've used what I would say, you know, a typical MIT spirit of being a little bit uh, creative. And uh, so it's, it is stored on the file system. It's stored in such a way to make it difficult to recover and it's stored in multiple ways and it's encrypted in multiple keys and there's a variety of system specific parameters which I will not get into, you know, listing every one of them here. So it's more of a security by obscurity. Yes. Yes. So if you know the specific uh, locations, you know, which may not even be files, I'll give you a hint, um, to look and you know how many keys are needed and you know how many bytes to read, you might be able to figure it out. Um, but to be honest with you, if you were able actually to get on the machine, it's game over, right? You're able to get on the machine, it's game over. Um, and you know, people who tell you that you know, they could still break into the machine and not compromise the key for some of these CAs, I, I'd be very skeptical about that. So we try to be fairly secure, but um, you know, it's not perfect. Um, other questions? 
Um, typically, what percent would you say of MIT accounts are compromised at any given time? Good question. Not yours, right? Um, I, I think I'm amazed. So, does everyone know what phishing is? Okay, good. I can't tell you how many talks I go to where they look at you and they say, isn't that like Seattle? Right? I mean, it's, you know, but that's a little bit of an older audience. Um, every time one of these phishing things happens, and they happen quite a bit where these emails go out, I will tell you, it amazes me. You're at the world's smartest institution, right? Let's, you know, I'm, as an alum, I'm pretty proud to, you know, believe that. You know, we're the world's leading technological institution in the world, right? I cannot tell you how many people reply to those things. It just always amazes me how many of them reply to, dear help desk, here's my username and password. It, it, it shocks me, right? And, and some, of them are, some of them are faculty, right? And, and they, they call the help desk and go, hey, I wrote back to your quota message. How come my quota hasn't gone up? And oh, by the way, like my inbox is full now. So you know, what happened? Well, you know, they got 200,000 bounce messages sitting in their inbox because it's being used to send you know, mass emails. So I'd be honest, I'd say we see 10, 15, 20 to 30 a month. Um, during one of these phishing spikes, even larger. And I think the ones that have been really interesting are the ones we don't know about, okay? And, you know, the government came to us, I don't know, about a year or two ago, and said, hey, um, you know, I won't get into the specifics, but there's a marketplace where you can buy MIT usernames and passwords so you can access library resources. And, you know, so they're, they're bidding on them online on these black markets. If, you, you know, if you'd like to access all the materials MIT has at their libraries or on campus, you can simply you know, auction one of these accounts that they've compromised off, off the web page. And they said, oh, by the way, do you know about this? Yeah, no. Uh, no. And uh, so we see a tremendous number of those. Um, the success of the social vectors for you know, getting people's credentials is incredibly high. In particular, across our industry, you know, Dave will talk about it a little bit, how you try and mitigate those things. It's very high. And it's a little bit scary. Yeah. Uh, uh, continuing on that, is there a way for, I don't know, some website to see uh, all the places you've logged in you with uh, Touchstone or something? Yeah. So um, we're working on, one of the things I talked about in answering to the log question was, you know, what do you guys collect? Uh, we collect a variety of information. One of the things we don't have a good ability to do today is to correlate. You know, so in our case, you know, there's 30 different technology systems involved in some of these things in different formats and you know, all sorts of different ways of generating it. Um, we are working to try and make that easier, and our hope is to give the user community something where from a GOIP or other standpoint, they can see where their activity has been over the last you know, uh, 30 days or seven days or whatever the retention period is to help inform people about where these things are happening. Dave wants to go a step further. He wants to have, you can pick a circle of radius where you're allowed to log in from geographically. And if you log in from outside that range, it either shouldn't allow it or just send a text to your phone or let you know that something happened, which I think is a step in the right direction. But uh, so yes, we're working on that, but don't have that today. Do you see a lot of malicious traffic on the MIT network? Yes. Um, in terms of primary source, is it from outside going in, or is, it, or is there malicious traffic from the inside going in? Uh, you know, I'd love to say it's usually from the outside coming in. I'd say, you know, there's a fair bit of it from the inside going out. Um, I think realistically, we have a tremendous amount of internet bandwidth and connectivity. Uh, and we'll talk about, you know, some of these more recent UDP reflection attacks, which is a great example. Uh, but, you know, when you have big pipes, it's a good resource to use to hurt other folks. And so we see a lot of that. I'd say more so than stuff coming in. Stuff coming in, you see a fair bit, like I talked about with the one laptop. But I'd say in terms of actual volume of traffic, the bigger stuff you see is leading out in terms of just sheer throughput. How many people connect to the network on a given day? Um, on a given day, I'd say we have, I don't know, 100,000, 120,000 different kinds of devices. I'd say people-wise, if you figure people out, you know, average two and a half devices, probably 35,000 folks, 40,000 folks on a given day. I think what's more surprising is our visitor population is fairly large in a month. Um, what's the policy of letting the tour exit on the MIT network? Policy? What? No. <laughs> so, you know, MIT is a very open place, all right? And I think that's one of the great beauties of being a student here, and one of the things I've always cherished about being here is we're a place where it's okay to experiment, it's okay to do things, it's okay to learn about things, it's okay to develop new things. It's one of the great things about being at MIT. And it's what's special about being here, too, right? That's what's pretty unique. You don't need to go to the policy office to say, hey, 
I want to run a Tor exit node today, or I want to invent a new you know, anonymous protocol or something like that. Um, that's one of the things that's really unique about working here and going to school here. And I think for us, you know, is, it a, is it a good idea or is it a bad idea? Depends what you're trying to do with it, right? If, you know, if you're doing it as part of you know, some thesis research into anonymization techniques and privacy, it's probably fine. If you're doing it for the purpose of you know, running some kind of you know, uh, black market ring or something like that, I mean, it's not, probably not a good idea. Um, but from a policy standpoint, MIT is fairly flexible. Uh, we you know, really try to balance um, the need for, the institution has a responsibility to behave responsibly, right? Let's just be honest. Uh, as an institution, we have to do that. But it, we try as much as possible not to encumber the activity of innovation. And so, you know, for the most part, that's worked out pretty well. I could say MIT has been fairly successful over the last 100, you know, 25 years. Um, but, you know, I think it's one of those areas where if something, one of those activities was to place the institution collectively in jeopardy, then we have to look at that. Uh, but, you know, MIT does run a variety of Tor exit nodes. SIPI has some. Uh, CCL has a few. Uh, they show up on Dave's, you know, naughty list like a plague, but, you know, we do have them. You can't run that at most schools. Other questions? And my esteemed colleague, Dave Laporte, uh, he comes to us from, uh, he used to work in the Harvard University Network. And I uh, can talk a little bit about networking at a liberal arts school if you get him outside of the office. And uh, he's also a uh, teacher himself at Northeastern, which uh, is great. So we will talk to you a little bit about some specific examples about the kinds of things that keep us up at night. Oh, wait, wait, I think I got it. Loose connection. Okay. Should I mention to it at MIT? All right, hello, everybody. My name is uh, Dave Laporte. Um, as this very verbose title Claims I am a manager of network infrastructure and security operations, which basically in a nutshell means that I'm responsible for um, maintaining and operating and securing MITnet, um, which is uh, definitely a full-time job. Um, today, I've got a lot of content to cover. Um, I'm going to kind of cruise through it to leave room for questions at the end because I think that's probably where you guys get the most out of it. Um, if anything's not clear, just stop me, raise your hand. I don't mind being interrupted. Um, but yeah, with that, we'll start talking um, with the security operations team, which is really the, the, the one central body that does uh, security as their full-time job here at MIT. We'll talk about some of the events that we've had in the recent past here um, and kind of what we've done to mitigate them and kind of leave us at the, at the, uh, the current state of security at MIT Net. We'll talk about the current landscape, um, what we're facing a lot of now, which is Mar Mark alluded to as, um, to a large degree, social. And uh, we'll talk about some future trends, which are nebulous kind of by, by nature. So the slides are kind of sparse. So the team there, um, as you can see, is Mark. I report directly to Mark. Under me, there's a security operations team led by our team lead, Harry Hoffman. He has three people under him. Um, uh, Andrew uh, Munchback, who basically is the analyst, who does a lot of the, the watching of the systems, does a lot of the notifications to users, responds to complaints from the outside world. We have Mike Hossel, who does a lot of the engineering activities, a lot of the forensics. And we have Monique Buchanan, who handles a lot of the, the uh, correspondence and community outreach. Um, Harry himself is also extremely hands-on. So I just want to preface this whole thing with, we have a team of four in a very large institution with tons of devices. So um, the federation that Mark talked about is really a necessity in order to, to even try to secure a network of this size. So kind of the portfolio of services we have and what we're going to blast through this stuff fast. Um, consulting, right, we talk with people and help them on campus. Um, services, we provide some services to the community. And the tool set that we use. The services we provide are, um, pretty varied. We do uh, abuse reporting. So this is response to complaints from the outside world, typically, um, the vast majority of which are Tor exit node related. Um, they just are. 
but um, um, endpoint protection. So there are some uh, tools and products out there that we install on both the community at large machines. You, you opt in if you prefer. Uh, if you're part of the MIT domain, which is typically administrative staff, uh, some might be auto-installed for you. Network protection, these are tool sets that we have either at the border or throughout the MIT net that kind of uh, detect anomalies or capture flow data for, for analysis. Uh, data analytics helps us correlate and put all this stuff together and try to get some actionable intelligence out of it. Um, forensics are, um, well, we'll talk about those in a second. Uh, risk identification, basically probing and assessment tools, uh, basically Nessus and um, things that look for PII, personally identifiable information, um, which being in Massachusetts, we need to comply with um, uh, 201 CMR 17, which is a mass regulation that requires us to be able to identify where all the PII on our network lives. Outreach, awareness, and training, just what it says. Uh, compliance needs, this is um, in large part PCI DSS. So PCI, being the payment card industry, has the DSS, which is the data security standard. Um, believe it or not, MIT, well, you probably believe it. MIT is a credit card merchant, right? We have multiple vendors on campus, um, and we need to be able to make sure that that infrastructure is compliant with the PCI DSS. So security is a part of the, the team that basically manages and ensures that compliance. Um, PCI 3.0, which is kind of the sixth major update to the standard goes live on January 1st, so we're kind of in the process right now of ensuring compliance of all of our infrastructure. And providing reporting alert, uh, alerting and metrics on the work we do. So here's some of the endpoint protection products uh, we use. Um, this Eagle, I think it's an Eagle there, is um, a tool called Crowd CrowdStrike, which is currently being tested within um, ISNT. Basically, it's a, a tool that watches for um, anomalous behavior from a system call perspective, right? If you're, if you're using Word and Word suddenly starts doing something that it shouldn't do, like maybe trying to read the account database off of the system and capture passwords, it alerts and throws a flag. Um, it's a cloud-based tool, which we'll talk more about later. Um, so all this data gets, gets sent to a central console and should machines start doing things untoward from a heuristic or behavioral perspective, they get red flagged. Uh, GPO here, these are just group policy objects, so managed systems, we push down policy. The S is Sophos, it's anti-X, right? It's anti-malware, anti-spam, uh, not anti-spam, but anti-malware, anti-virus, all of the typical stuff that we expect when we buy an endpoint protection product. PGP um, does uh, uh, hard drive encryption for select systems on campus that have sensitive data. Um, some of these tools are in flux. Uh, the, the industry seems to be going more towards a more vendor, um, vendor neutral solution, if you want to call it that. So BitLocker on Windows, File Vault on the Mac. So we're exploring those options as well. And Casper is a way to uh, manage mostly Macs, to, keep, to, to enforce policy on managed Macs. On the network protection side, um, I'll just start down here. Akamai is a company that has uh, that came out of MIT, right? Has a lot of MIT alums. They also have extremely good services. Um, so we have partnered with them on a lot of uh, a lot of their services, and we'll talk about them fairly extensively. Tipping Point is an IDS vendor, an intrusion detection system. Um, as I said, some of these tools are in flux. Um, that might be one of them, but we we're, we're basically have a, a, an intrusion prevention system at our border. We don't actually prevent, we just detect. So we don't actually block anything uh, on the MIT border, except for some very basic uh, anti-spoofing and standard rules you'd find anywhere. StealthWatch is a tool that generates NetFlow data, or I should say collects NetFlow data. So we are... Um, we use Cisco devices, but all network devices will output uh, details, meta, meta information about the flows that they're sending, you know, source port, desk port, source IP, desk IP, protocol, et cetera. Um, StealthWatch collects this, does some basic security analysis on it, and also provides APIs that we can interface our tools with to do some more intelligent things. And RSA Security Analytics. This is another tool. Oops. It's a... Uh, in a lot of ways, like an IDS on steroids, um, it does uh, full packet capture, so you can actually see some content if, if things get red flagged. On the risk identification front, uh, Nessus, um, kind of the de facto 
vulnerability assessment tool. So we typically will use this on demand. We don't unleash this on 18 slash 8 at large. But if we get a, a, uh, an on-campus um, DLC that would like us to come in and perform some basic uh, assessment for them, we can use Nessus. Uh, Shodan is a computer, they call it a computer search engine, but basically it, they scan the internet at large and have lots of lots of good security data. We have a subscription so that we can leverage that intelligence. And Identity Finder as a tool that we use in locations where there's PII, personally identifiable information, in order to comply with mass regs and just to make sure we know where critical data lives. Forensics. Um, Forensics is um, a business that is um, periodic. I'm looking for the right word. This isn't something we do until we do a lot of it for a long time, and then we don't do a lot of it. Basically, when cases surface, we have the tool sets. Uh, and case is a tool that allows us to image drives and go through them looking for content. FTK, the Forensics Toolkit, and the Sleuth Kit are other tools. Um, we often get called in for cases where we have to image drives um, for intellectual property cases or whatever cases the OGC, the Office of the General Counsel, needs to have computers imaged for. Um, so we have all the tool sets necessary to do that. But frankly, it's not, it's not our day job. It's, it's something that comes up occasionally. So how do we put all this data together? Mark alluded to uh, correlation. We have um, operating system logs from managed systems. You can see it. We have NetFlow. We have some DHCP logs, IDS logs, uh, touchstone logs. Splunk is a tool um, that does a lot of this uh, uh, correlation work and take um, data that's not necessarily normalized and normalize it and allow us to correlate across different sources to kind of get more intelligence. So when you were talking about um, whomever out there asked about maybe a login page that could show where you last logged in, um, et cetera. Splunk would really probably be the enabling technology for that. Because we could put everything together. We can do GOIP lookups and really build something on top of the raw data, right? Pull some actual um, wisdom out of that data so that we could present it to you at, in a page. OK, so now we'll talk about attacks and um, things that you might find more interesting. Um, we'll talk first about distributed denial of service attacks, which we've really received a lot of um, in the past few years. We'll also talk specifically about attacks that resulted from um, the Aaron Schwartz strategy of a few years ago, um, which ties into the distributed denial of service attacks. Okay, so just a primer on distributed denial of service. I apologize if this is remedial. Um, so a denial of service attack right, really attacks the A of the CIA triad, right? CIA triad is the foundation of computer security, it's confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So we're going after the availability, right? We want to take a resource down so that legitimate users can't use it. Uh, that could be defacement of a page, very simple, right? Digital graffiti, just ruin the page so nobody can see it. Could be resource consumption, where you eat up all the, uh, the computation on a system, all the bandwidth on a network. Could be a single attacker. But much more likely nowadays, you're going to invite your friends and you're going to have a party and a DDoS, a distributed denial of service. Um, recent attacks, these are, okay, these are recent trends in the industry. This, these are pulled from the Arbor Network's, uh, I think, State of the Internet report. Um, hacktivism is the most common motiv motivation. Um, according to them, it's 40% of all claimed, um, actually, those attacks that are attributed, 40% of them are attributed to hacktivism. The next one is 39% unknown. So it's, it's <laughs> dominating the, 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 uh, the top of the heap. Um, last year, and these numbers I believe are from 2013, there were multiple 100 gig plus attacks. Right? So the year before that made news because I think there was an attack on Spam House that was 300, 300 gigabits. This following year, that's kind of, I wouldn't say the norm, but we're seeing a lot more of that. Longer lasting attack. Um, this operation here, Abibal, was a, a multi-month attack against the US financial sector. Um, it went on for months. It was 65 gigs sustained at times. Um, I've heard stories about this, but you can Google more online, where it was just relentless, right? They just couldn't stop it. And we'll talk about the way that they ended up doing it. Um, but frankly, at 65 gig or at 100 gig, you're at the mercy of the attacker, right? There's very few organizations on the planet 
um, that can sustain an attack, can, can sustain, a, a, can, you know, survive a sustained attack of that magnitude. You just can't do it. Um, and we're seeing a shift towards reflection and amplification attacks. So this is where you take um, a small input and generate a large output. Right? This is nothing new. This goes way back to, um, let's skip ahead a sec. I, I left that slide out. But this goes way back to um, the ICMP uh, smurf attack, uh, where you would ping a broadcast address of a network, and every machine on that network would respond to the supposed um, originator of the packet, which of course would be spoofed, right? So I would masquerade as Mark, I would send a packet to this class's broadcast address, and you would all respond with packets to Mark, um, thinking that he sent it. Meanwhile, I sit in the corner and laugh. Uh, so this is, this is nothing new. This goes back, I mean, when I was in high school, I was, I was reading about this stuff. <laughs> um, so UDP and ICMP, but UDP is a fire and forget protocol, right? It's not TCP, it's not reliable, it's not connection oriented. So fire and forget, it's easily spoofable. And over the past year, what we've seen are um, exploits of amplifiable features of these three protocols in particular. So DNS, this isn't working, oh, it works for the clicker. Uh, DNS, uh, port 53, UDP, right? Um, basically, if you send a 64-byte any query to a misconfigured server, it would respond with a 512-byte response. So that's an 8x amplification factor there. Not bad. Um, what we found personally here on MITnet was when this whole trend started, like most things, um, EDUs, and particularly here, we were at the forefront of this trend. We were seeing this before it really took off and against um, commercial victims. But we saw a 12 gig um, DNS amplification attack here, which substantially impacted our outbound bandwidth. Um, we have, we have uh, sufficient bandwidth, but at those rates, if you add that to, to legitimate traffic, we started to notice issues, and Mark and I had to come in and resolve that. <coughs> um, SNMP, which is UDP port 161, um, very useful management protocol. But if you send a get bulk request of 64 bytes uh, to a device that's improperly configured, it will respond with um, up to 1,000x amplification. So that's even better, right? If you're an attacker, you're going to target things. And we saw huge attacks against um, printers on campus. So they would have a printer with an open SNMP agent. They would send packets, uh, packets to it, and we would send back 1,000 of them you know, and pollute the internet. NTP, network time protocol. Um, in this case, a misconfigured server would respond to a mon list command, which would, um, I'm not sure the amplification factor on that one, but that one was really, really popular. Um, so we got hit pretty hard with the NTP mon list um, misconfiguration. And we ended up doing a few things to mitigate all these attacks. So on the NTP side, we disabled monlist on any NTP server we could, which kind of kills the attack in its tracks. But this being a federated institution where we don't have power over nearly anything, or I shouldn't say that, nearly everything, right? There's just a lot of things we just don't have the reach to touch uh, or the authority to touch. So what we ended up doing was just rate limiting NTP at the border. And that's been in place now for almost a year almost a year um, with almost no negative impact. So we rate limited down to, um, let's say, a few megabits, and, uh, which was certainly better than the gigs we were sending out to the internet previously. So that's kind of a solved problem. Uh, DNS um, is a bit harder, was, was a bit harder to uh, take care of. What we ended up doing was started to leverage an, an Akamai service called eDNS. So Akamai has this service where you can host your zones with them. Um, they're one of many providers, but we had an existing relationship with Akamai, which I'll talk about in a minute. So we leveraged their eDNS, kind of bifurcated our DNS, uh, our, our domain name system space. We put an external view on Akamai. We put an internal view um, on the servers that had always served MIT. And then we ACL'd off the internal view. So only MIT clients can hit our internal servers, and the rest of the world hits Akamai. The benefit of Akamai eDNS is it's hosted in a, a content distribution network. It's all over the world. It's being served out of Asia, Europe, uh, North, North America East, West. It's, it's all over the place, right? 
most, play, most people can't take down Akamai, so we don't have to worry about our DNS going down anymore. So that's kind of how we resolve that problem. Um, okay, so these are details of, uh, of the attacks themselves, source obfuscation, this is probably remedial. Uh, why do you do it? To avoid detection and prosecution. Um, I'll skip that one. Okay, so maybe you don't want to hide your address or spoof your address, you just want to um, destroy a target with bots, right? So botnets are huge right now. <coughs> um, the it's okay, no problem, bro, was um, used in that Operation Avival, which really targeted the US financial sector. Um, so in this case, rather than just spoofing a bunch of packets from, from one host, we're using a botnet of legitimate, connect, uh, of legitimate systems that don't necessarily need to um, just spoof. Since these are legitimate systems and they'll respond to, say, a TCP um, SYNAC, we can actually do more higher level attacks, like attack an HTTP server and do GET and POST floods. Um, they might hire stressors. Stressors are you know, basically botnets for hire, where you, um, you hire them to do um, load testing, and they go and load test someone else for you. Um, there's no doubt probably legitimate ones out there, um, but there are others that aren't and are basically um, denial of servicers for hire. Okay, so the mitigation strategies. We talked about one, which is DNS, right? We can use DNS to mitigate these attacks. So we have used Akamai to do that. <coughs> and this graphic here, which is uh, probably too small for you to see, but basically this slide is way too far ahead where it should be. So, okay, we had an attack against our web server, so I'll just brief you real quick. One of the attacks that followed uh, the Swartz tragedy was an attack against web.mit. They took down our web server. The way we solved that um, was we used our bifurcated DNS to point internal clients to web.mit internally, and then we used the Akamai content distribution network to basically mirror web.mit, and then we used the external view of our DNS to point external clients to Akamai. So when um, a user out on the internet, which we'll say is over here, wants to go to web.mit, they actually go to the Akamai CDN, which serves up the content. If it's content that for some reason they can't directly serve out of cache, if it's dynamic or whatever, um, the origin server, which is still web.mit, um, um, uh, Akamai will go and fetch the necessary content, send it to the user, and then potentially cache it for some interval. Uh, so short story here is that um, the attack I'll talk about in a minute, the way we resolved it was we put the, uh, the actual web server on the content distribution network of Akamai. The other attacks that we've, um, we'll talk about, this is how we mitigated. These two slides are out of, out of uh, order. Um, so I mentioned a few attacks. I mentioned the NTP attack. Um, I'm going to mention a, a couple others. But basically, these are attacks that are just brute force trying to overwhelm our bandwidth. And I mentioned when you get up into the tens of gigabits range, um, a lot of internet end users, such as MIT, right? maybe not a service provider, but a very large user, even we would have trouble handling tens of gigabits uh, of traffic. So in that case, your options are really limited, right? If it's spoof traffic, how do you put a, a filter at your border to block this traffic? And even so, once it's got to your border where you filter it, it's already flooded your pipes. So how do you, how do, you do this, right? You have to push it back up into the cloud, into the internet, and block it there. And the way that many people are choosing to do it, and the way we've done it here, is through BGP mitigation. So if you're familiar with BGP, which is Border Gateway Protocol, it's kind of the protocol that runs routing on the internet. And it's a, a path vector protocol that uses ASNs, autonomous system, uh, autonomous system numbers. So every multi-homed organization on the internet has an ASN, an autonomous system number. And it uses that number in order to build, uh, BGP uses that number to build paths through the internet so that you can have multiple paths to get to a particular ASN. Um, in this case, I'm using example one, two, three, because I created this for another organization. Here, we're three, right? Because we're awesome like that. Um, Harvard was 11, so they're a little slower to the, to the punch. But in this case, we've got a path. So we've got the beginning of the path is ASN 123. The end of the path is 789. 
And there's some sequence of AS and AS's autonomous systems that this packet has to pass through. So what we're going to do with BGP mitigation is just inject another ASN in the mix. And that ASN has the capabilities to kind of handle this traffic on our behalf. So in this case, we have ASN 456. And they are going to be kind of a sanctioned man in the middle for us. We're going to allow them to advertise our prefixes so that when we come under attack, um, if 18.1.2.3.0 slash 24, right, a small slice of 255 addresses at MIT comes under attack, we allow this AS of 456 to advertise that prefix on our behalf. Um, once, the, once that change propagates across the internet, all of the traffic starts going into that AS. And in this case for us, that AS is Akamai. And they have lots of scrubbers and, and can handle the high bandwidth that we can't. So on the back end of that connection is a private connection we have into Akamai, where they send kind of the, the post-scrubbed and clean traffic out to us. Uh, in that way, we can kind of avoid these sorts of um, potentially deadly attacks that could just take us offline. If you're getting hit with that much traffic, there's just nothing you can do. <clears throat> Um, so actually, before we keep going, any, any questions on what we've covered so far? Yes? So this is just more of a networking question. You mentioned the borders. Yes. Um, and, uh, but it's a more extent that, that anyone can connect to uh, uh, London. So I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to understand the, the, the structure. The structure? Of the MIT network and, and what a border actually is. Let's see. Let me see if I can pull up a quick, a quick diagram for you. Oh, that's right, yeah, it's a video camera, it's not. So, um, uh, MIT really has um, three border routers, um, external one, external two, and another router, let's just call it external three. So these are our So basically, the actual MIT net is pretty much a standard hub and spoke topology. We have uh, core switches connect out to a distribution layer, and then they go out to access layers, which are basically buildings. At the border, we have these three borders here. Um, this is incredibly vague. I apologize. But we have multiple providers. Um, so for instance, our commercial providers will soon be dual home to both of our border routers. This external router three here, <coughs> excuse me, um, which is not its real name, but this, this external router here is basically for uh, research peering. So we we've kind of have a, a delineation between commodity and uh, commercial peering and research peering. So all of the, the BGP we're talking about happens between the external border and our providers and back up into the internet itself. Oh, and, and these are just uh, choke point routers that we have between our border and our core. <coughs> OK, so in response to the Swartz tragedy of, um, I believe it was two years ago, I had just started here, um, certain hacktivists took it upon themselves to attack MIT as an institution. So we, we experienced three t attacks. And I'm going to go through all three because there were three separate um, and distinct types of attacks. So the first attack was against our infrastructure itself. So at the time, um, MIT uh, did and does and will you know, support openness. And we have a very open network, especially in regards in comparison to other .edu's um, having come from another one. Um, that can be a blessing and a curse from a security perspective, right? So we're open to the world. In this case, our border routers, these guys here that we just drew, we're running an older version of software that was uh, vulnerable to a particular um, denial of service attack. So the attackers in this case sent a very low bandwidth stream. I mean, it, it was really low. It was less than 100K. It would have been totally non-noticeable without actually going on the device and debugging. They sent it to the management interface of those devices. And those devices promptly just keeled over. Right? They didn't die, but the CPU spiked. They weren't routing packets. MITnet at that point was offline. 
so in this case, this was the first, the first uh, attack we experienced. Uh, I think it was during the Patriots playoff game. Um, sometimes I think these things are planned to find it when staff is not paying attention. Um, so it was during that playoff game. Um, what we ended up doing was immediately upgrading the software to a patched version, right? That was a quick triage fix. Um, the longer term fix was that uh, outsiders on the internet probably don't need to access our management interfaces, right? A very select few need to um, access those interfaces. So we ended up um, implementing um, basically least privilege so that only the, the IP addresses of our staff on VPN could access them. And we turned on, um, we stopped using clear text uh, management protocols. So that one was fixed. Then attack two came in. <coughs> oh, question, sorry. Um, okay. So is it not correct that this was a zero day attack against the sister router? I think it would be fair to say that it was not a zero day attack. Yeah. Um, the second attack was against web.mit.edu itself. And this is kind of what I alluded to on the, um, the DNS mitigation slide that I got ahead of myself on. So web.mit was uh, in our data center protected by a firewall, um, so it was behind a firewall. What ended up happening was that uh, the attackers sent a, a flood of HTTP traffic, right? It was, it was a get and post flood. I'm not sure which one it was. <coughs> um, but basically, they didn't kill the web server. They killed the firewall. Uh, the firewall keeled over because firewalls, too, are a blessing and a curse, right? A, a stateless router access list. Um, it's very simple, it's very fast, but you also lose a lot of the granul granularity in what you can filter on. Because it's doing it packet by packet, you can only use the criteria in each packet, ports and IP addresses, mostly. We had it behind a firewall, um, which worked well when it worked, but when it came under load, the state required of a firewall, because uh, a, a firewall is tracking every state in addition to the packets, it died. <coughs> so the triage fix for this attack was that we moved it to a routed network. Um, and that's something um, we would have preferred not to do, but you really had to due to the, the attack that was ongoing. The longer term mitigation that we performed was that we moved it to the Yakima CDN. So you may notice if you go outside of MIT and you go to web.mit now, it doesn't resolve to um, 18.9.22 anymore. It resolves to uh, a C name, which in turn resolves to an Akamai uh, IP address. And attack number three, um, this one actually wasn't um, on, the, on the side of MIT net. This was on the side of our registrar. So we, um, we found the home page of MIT, www.mit and web.mit, replaced with this page here. And we kind of quickly did some um, diagnostics on the web server. Everything looked fine. The server was not compromised. It was not defaced like this. And what we did end up finding was that our who is information um, for our, our name and our actual uh, DNS delegations were, were broken. So in this case, you can see the administrative contact. Um, I got owned, and then our address, owned network operations, um, destroyed Massachusetts. They were clearly just trying to, to poke at, at us. Um, but it was delegated out to these two servers at Cloudflare, which is a, a cloud-based hosting provider. So this is um, what I call the troll. This was on Gizmodo. This was a bit of um, indirection on the part of the attackers, however many there were. Um, hack went down like this. So this is what he told the world very soon after this, this happened. So once we realized that, that the, it wasn't MIT or anything on MIT net that was hacked, it was actually our registrar, we got in contact with our registrar, we got our records changed, we got everything locked down. But of course, there's, in DNS, there's time to live values involved. Some of them are ours. So there was a bit of, um, after this attack was resolved, there was still some kind of flux afterwards. And during that time, we're kind of cleaning it, trying to clean everything up. He posts on Gizmodo in the, the comments on an article about this, um, own the MIT not guy with a browser exploit, that guy. Um, get their Educause logins, which were blah, create a flag. So he goes through the, um, he goes through the whole scenario, but the vector here was the MIT not guy. Um, so Mark is swearing at the time up and down, not actually swearing, but swearing up and down that it's not him. He's not compromised. Um, so what we did end up finding out after the fact was 
This was published well after the incident. That link is still live if you want to read about it. This was, um, this was indirection. It, it wasn't true. The actual vector was that our entire registrar was owned. Uh, our registrar being .edu is run by an organization called Educause. Um, turns out that every DNS uh, registration account had been compromised. The attacker had this for I don't know how long, but they just decided to show their hand with the MIT uh, hack here and actually use their power to expose themselves but to also hack our DNS. Um, so this one wasn't actually um, anybody at MIT's fault. It was uh, on the part of our registrar, which they soon acknowledged. This was in February of 2013. They mentioned that uh, they were, in fact, breached and we all had to change our passwords. And do they have two-factor now? No. Okay. <laughs> but, about it, okay. But we, we ended up locking down our domain account so that it couldn't be changed. But, you know, it turns out if, if the entire system is owned, if you check a box that says locked, which prevents people from updating it, it doesn't do much good. Um, in any case, they've kind of fixed their system. And um, this one wasn't our fault, but it was kind of an interesting one because it really subverted some of the core protocols of the internet in order to, to do this. OK, so the current threat landscape. I'm doing on time. OK. Ah. Um, so if you can't exploit the silicon, the silicon, exploit the carbon, right? Exploit the user at the keyboard. And this is what we're seeing a lot of now. Um, I mean, from my personal experience, having been in this for almost 20 years, the network-based vector, the net, with the exception of this year, which I'll talk about in a minute, but the network-based vector, you know, attacks that originate on the network and remotely exploit hosts, that isn't a lot of what we see anymore. Um, computer systems actually do seem to be getting more secure from the outside, at least. You know, Windows and Solaris and Linux in the, the old days, maybe a decade ago, they used to ship with all their services enabled. Right? I called it lit up like a Christmas tree. Everything would be on because on the, you know, the convenience and security continuum, if, if we agree that one exists, some people don't, but they were way on the convenience side. You wanted everything to work out of the box. Um, whereas I think we found a sensible medium now where when you install a, a fresh operating system, there is a host-based firewall running um, and you know, there aren't world accessible services running on a system. We've also got things like Windows Update and, and Apple Update and package managers and all the Linux distros so that a box that gets online pretty quickly will get itself up to date. So you don't have these ancient boxes with ancient services open to the world. Okay, so where I was going with that is they've kind of moved up the stack now, right? Um, maybe they're at level eight or nine now. They're dealing with people and they're trying to exploit human um, failings or frailties like fear or greed or trust or familiarity to, to kind of leverage uh, credentials so that they can exploit application access or privileged access rather than exploiting hosts themselves. They're, they're exploiting people. Um, a few things we've seen on campus in the very recent past. Um, this one here, oh, I should say, we have not experienced this one on, ca on, on campus. I don't want to scare anybody. Um, this has been seen, though, across the nation in, in different .edu's, and it's a very serious threat, so we're moving quickly to address it. However, we have not actually seen it here. So this threat um, is spear phishing, and this is probably remedial, but spear phishing targets a particular community with a plausible message, right? So if you just get spam messages or phishing messages, they're just casting kind of a, a wide net and catching people who, uh, for some bizarre reason, might respond to that. However, if... Um, in a spear phishing attack, they're able to narrow it and find a community of interest that they can actually say something that sounds mildly plausible, right? Bank of America customers or MIT student staff and faculty. Um, <coughs> in this case, they were able to choose communities of different institutions, um, not singling anybody out, but it is public and Boston University was one of them. Um, they uh, targeted the community with bogus email messages pointing to a bogus authentication site. Some percentage of the users actually clicked through and logged in, which of course gave the attacker the credentials. The attacker then went to the legitimate site and redirected those users' direct deposits to an account of, under their control and emptied that account. Um, I'm not sure the number, uh, the dollars affected there are public, but it was probably a large amount. Um, so in response to this, I mean, how do you combat that, right? To a large extent, it's a user education issue. Uh, so community awareness. Just let people know you can't trust email. You just have to 
verify things before you click on them. But um, from experience and just knowing human nature, that's only going to get you so far. There's always going to be some percentage of people who click on it. And I'm, I'm amazed. I, I'm kind of, as you can imagine, you all probably are as well. I'm the repository of all the phishing messages my family receives. So <laughs> I'm getting stuff from, from my father, my sister, like, is this legit? And it's getting increasingly hard to tell. So you've got to actually go into the headers and see where it's coming from. Um, <coughs> And a lot of mail clients now, they don't actually like to show you the link that it points to, which gets really annoying. Um, so it's getting harder. So some of it is just user error, um, for lack of a better word. And some of it is it's just increasingly difficult to tell. So at the root of the problem, in my opinion, is that passwords are just a dead technology, right? Um, in terms of the factors, it's something you know, a password, something you are, maybe a biometric, or something you have, a token. Um, so what we're doing to try to mitigate this, this here, because basically these man-in-the-middle attacks are just stealing something you know. They're stealing your password. Well, if we can also add something that you have, um, that attack is only going to get them halfway. They're not going to be able to compromise your, your uh, identity. You, you won't be able to compromise, uh, the attacker won't be able to compromise the identity of the user. So, we are rolling out uh, a second authentication factor in the near term that will be tied into our Touchstone uh, IDP. Um, we can release that to these guys, right? So early release, if you're interested, if you go to duo.mit.edu, um, we're using a, uh, a vendor called Duo Security. It's a cloud-based two-factor authentication system that's kind of uh, being used in a lot of EDUs. But basically, you'll register your phone as, uh, as a second factor. And you run a little smartphone app. If you don't have a smartphone, um, I'm sorry, but if you, if, if you don't, yeah, if you don't have one, you can also do it um, via SMS. It will actually call you and tell you a number. Um, and you can also generate um, um, one time password site, kind of like a, a, ten, uh, a list of 10 passwords that you can use. So this is coming soon to the community. Uh, it is completely active at this point. It's just not announced. If you want to go to duo.mit, you can opt your phone in. You can actually turn on Touchstone. Um, I'll give you a quick, a quick demo to show you how it integrates. The beauty of using standards um, and federated systems like uh, SAML and Shibboleth, which kind of underlay Touchstone, is that we can easily lay on um, additional factors. So in this case, I'm going to just go to a, a tool that I use which is transparently going to authenticate me using, yeah. excuse me, touchstone with my certificate. But I should now get prompted for two factor. Who runs this now? <laughs> I don't know that guy. I don't know. Um, <laughs> got on. <laughs> Give me a site to hit. I'm just drawing a blank because I'm in front of a crowd. Splunk? Splunk. No, not Splunk. Well, <laughs> because that's not a native touchstone integration. Um, Atlas. Atlas, yeah. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, he's very secure at least, right? No the only real security is to stay off the internet. All right, if this doesn't work in 20 seconds, I will move on. You have another browser, maybe? It's cached? Maybe. There we go. Oh, weird. OK, so here's my typical touchstone login. Now, you're going to just get one more prompt. Well, you're actually off the Wi-Fi, it looks like. Oh, man. What do I do? All right. Well, let's leave that demo for after class. And let's edit that out. It's back now. All right. That's, I had not rehearsed that demo, so that's what I get. But. Um, Trust me, it works. If you go to Duo, you can register yourself. Um, and all of your two-factor inter inter uh, interactions, or I'm sorry, your touchstone interactions will all be two-factored now, and you'll be super secure. Uh, it really does work well. 
Um, another threat we've <clears throat> we've experienced in the past um, few months is this again is something that's targeting um, not just EDUs but organizations uh, across the country but we've been getting police caller ID spoofing and this kind of transcends right the digital world uh, for, the, for the most part members of the MIT community are getting calls from local police departments um, nearby their hometowns I'm sorry yes so um, these police departments are telling them um, bad news right they're telling them you're about to be charged with a crime. I think some of them are tax fraud. Um, your family member's been in an accident. Of course, it's not real. It's, uh, their call's coming from an attacker who's using um, ANI, which is automated. They're using SIP, basically, to coerce their from okay. field in their voice call, right? OK, which feeds into caller ID. Which then gets translated by a ridge who trusts the from field and a SIP message to be whatever number's placed in it. OK. And so the attacker's like, all right, so I sign up you know, cheapy SIP service, and I'll set my from field to be, you know, the police department's number in Lexington, and I'll send it, and once it gets to the, you know, transcoding gateway that turns it back into traditional telephony, it says, all right, well, that's the number it's from. We'll just show it to the user when it shows up. Yeah. So you end up getting a call from what you think is a police department with extremely bad news. Again, they're exploiting human frailty here. In this case, it's probably fear. Maybe it's a little anger, but it's, you know, in the case that you or might guilt. be... guilt. What's that? Or guilt. Yeah, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> If it's legit. But in any case, these calls all come to the same point, which is, you know, you need to pay a fee for something. Um, which on its face is kind of bogus, but once they've told you this, I mean, if they told me that my wife was in a car accident, I would not be in the right state of mind, and I might believe some craziness that they tell me after the fact. So um, we've had users who, uh, or, or people on campus who, um, I don't think it's actually, anyone has actually paid. But we have had multiple targets of this attack. And again, this isn't just here. Uh, if, you, if you Google it, you'll find reports of it from, in Pittsburgh newspapers and all over the country. Um, but again, this is a spear phishing attack, right? They, they figure out where you live, and they can do this by just Googling your name or um, just looking at MIT and checking the directory and finding out some details about you. And they just need enough to be plausible. And then they proceed to call you and scare you and try to extort you. Um, the, the mitigation here is difficult, right? Uh, because it involves the phone system, it involves multiple bridges, it's, um, frankly, I'm not a phone guy, so it involves lots of stuff I'm just going to wave my hands about, but law enforcement needs to be involved here. Uh, you have to go to your providers and work with law enforcement to get that traced back. Uh, actually, before I, and, and one more, um, along the spear phishing email side of things. Um, there's another thing that some people call whaling, which is the intentional targeting of high-level staff at an organization. Um, we have experienced this. Uh, I've experienced it elsewhere, but we've also experienced this here, where they will send extremely targeted messages at high-level staff um, using org charts, using directories to find you know, plausible reporting relationships and write some really believable messages um, that if you're not careful when you click reply, you know, that wire transfer number that they're asking for isn't going to the person that you think sent the message. It's going to somewhere um, on the other side of the world or the other side of the country. Uh, so we've been experiencing this as well. You know, the short of it is, and you're in a security class, you know this, SMTP is not a reliable protocol. You can't believe pretty much anything in there, um, which just runs completely counter to human nature. So take everything with a grain of salt. You going to tell the story? No. You can. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So yeah, you could tell. Basically, sure? we had one recently, and I won't go into the details of the names. You know, keep anonymity. But uh, a senior member of um, the administration, you know, reaches out and says, um, "Hey, I got this email from, uh, you know, this is from someone, and says I need to, you know, help a very senior executive with a uh, wire transfer." And so he sent me this email, and I replied, and then he said, I, I, "He didn't know what I was talking about." And so, how did that happen? Is my email account hacked? It says, he, it says I sent this email, but I didn't. And you know, to Dave's point, you know, the whole possibility that email itself could somehow be spoofed without your account itself being compromised is very foreign to people, right? It's a trust relationship. So it turns out, I guess it was someone at an internet cafe in Nigeria or something like that, um, which we were joking about. But yeah, they basically went to the MIT org chart, found a senior executive found someone in the vice president of finance office and said, hey, I need you to help me with this wire transfer call. You know, here's the number. And 
you know, these are the kinds of things that happen yeah. every day. It didn't, they didn't transfer the money, obviously. The email is totally believable. Yeah. I, I've seen it. Even the um, tone and everything seemed yeah. very plausible. They actually used email messages the senior executive had written that were posted on public websites because they sent memos to the community and things like that. They used the exact same style. Introduction, the way they closed the message, even the, even the language and terms they used was identical to stuff they had used in other ways. So it's, it was actually kind of creepy because yeah. even when I first read it, if you didn't know, it was, you would, it was semi-possible. And thankfully, the, the staff member that was requested of, like this was kind of an out of the ordinary request. It got flagged even though it looked legitimate and he, he uh, or she responded uh, directly to the sender you know, removing the reply to address and actually putting in a known good one from, from uh, his address book or her address book and uh, responded and asked and un kind of unveiled the whole scheme. But it could have been, it could have gone south really quickly. Okay, so I mentioned that the network-based vector in my experience isn't as prevalent as it used to be and I kind of, I'll kind of belie that here or make a lie of it here. Um, this year has been a, a year of major exploits. Um, every single major SSL implementation has been targeted, right? There was um, the S channel on the Microsoft side. There was the, the Apple implementation, uh, OpenSSL. There was Poodle with SSL v3. <coughs> um, all of these are, this is SSL, right? This is a security service. So when you put a, face, put a service up facing the world, you're going to run SSL. So we had a, a lot of world-facing services out there that were vulnerable to some of these things. Uh, Shellshock was one that affected the Bash shell, where uh, you could remotely exploit a system. So these were all kind of the, the gold standard of a network-based um, exploit. They were remotely exploitable, and they could get administrative privileges. Um, so it's been a kind of a, a, a nasty year in terms of that. So it's, in my opinion, a bit of an outlier. But how do we deal with this? Um, because these services are public. They need to be public. We can't just fence them off because they're vulnerable to something. Um, the first thing is automatic patching. Um, in the old days, the latency between you know, a zero day coming out and a patch coming out was fairly long. That's shortening and shortening and shortening, so we're down to literally hours. Um, so when these things surface, we're able to push out updates to at least the systems that we maintain. Um, the systems we don't maintain, uh, we're able to use our, our communication folks, um, uh, like the communications office and Monique on, on the security team, to craft messages to go out to the community to at least alert them to the fact that you really need to patch because this is dangerous and it's out there. Um, on the kind of more active front, we can detect these scans. So the Stealth Watch tool I mentioned way back is a tool that pulls NetFlow data off of our network devices. Um, and we can do some basic heuristics on that. And if we see an outside IP address talking to several hundred MIT systems, that's probably not good. Um, it could be good, and if it's good, we will totally whitelist it, and we've done that many, many times for research projects and just things that are legitimate. But it's probably not a bad posture to say, okay, if we see that, it's probably bad. Let's uh, block it. So we actually have some automated BGP null routing going on, where we're actually watching the flows, and if we see anomalous behavior, we will null, null route on the fly. That runs every five minutes, so as soon as a scan starts, we, we try to cut it off at the knees. Um, on a more, uh, a more proactive front even than that is we will proactively scan. So in the case of uh, shell shock and some of the earlier SSL vulner vulnerabilities that were really deadly, we actually scanned the community and sent out lists to those we had contact info for to let them know, hey, this IP address is running a service that's known vulnerable, please patch it. Um, it's really just about getting the information out to the community as quickly as we can. Okay, future trends, because we're running short on time. Uh, consumerization of IT. Um, these are kind of, I, I call them future trends, but the future is now here at MIT and pretty much at any .edu. These are old things that we've been dealing with. Um, bring your own device. I mean, I've owned my phone here and at other institutions in the EDU space forever. Um, it makes policy enforcement really difficult because how do you enforce policy on a, a device that you, know, you didn't pay for and that you don't manage? Um, consumerization of services. Um, here at MIT, we have an, an enterprise agreement with Dropbox now so that you can store data up on Dropbox. Unlimited storage, that's open to students, right? Yes, unlimited storage on Dropbox, which is great. Um, 
the problems that come along with that are maybe data custody, right? Where's that data going to live? In our case, we've made sure that, you know, jurisdiction will always be in the United States, but what happens if you're dealing with a provider that crosses national boundaries into areas where um, they have different regulations? Uh, what do you do if a person um, puts sensitive information up on that Dropbox and it gets synced up to the cloud and, and uh, they think it just lives in the cloud, but we know that Dropbox syncs to the local system. There's a lot of issues involved with, with these consumerization of IT, um, with the consumerization of IT, because the IT department doesn't control the service anymore. They're really just brokering the service between the service provider and the consumer. Um, Third-party email providers, kind of same thing. You might send sensitive information through a, an email system that's not totally internal, so sensitive data might leave the institution. Uh, Cloud-based resources kind of ties into that as well. Um, MIT never really had a perimeter. Neither does the rest of the world now, right? Um, if you're a small startup, and um, I'm sure you all have many friends at startups, I do as well, none of them have local resources anymore, right? They're using stuff that's entirely in the cloud. How do you draw a line or put a moat around those resources when they're living in Amazon Web Services and it's Salesforce.com and it's Google Apps and it's Dropbox? Uh, we need to find different ways to handle that. Uh, we have the same data custody issues as to where that data might live. We've also got authentication and authorization issues. Um, how do you make sure that just your users are accessing those services? And that's where things like SAM will come in, um, which I think MIT is really well positioned because we have this really robust SAML architecture. When we wanted to add Dropbox, it was easy enough to add them as a service provider to our, um, our touchstone infrastructure, and it just worked. I'm sure I'm glazing over some things, but you know, in the grand scheme, standards-based and federated systems like SAML and, and uh, Shibboleth are really lifesavers in a cloud-based world. Uh, the Internet of Things, what does that mean, right? It seems to be the new um, buzzword du jour. But in terms of our experience so far, the Internet of Things at MIT Net, um, we have building, building management systems all over, right? These are computer systems that are built by the fine folks that build air conditioners last year. So they're not all that secure for the most part. Um, Mark had the story about they were just living on public MIT net, right? They could be probed by anyone on the world. What we've started to do, and actually we're almost entirely done with our building management systems, is move them onto a different VRF, which is a virtual routing and forwarding instance, so that they have a completely different forwarding path, and we front end it with a firewall. It's all access controlled. It lives on separate physical infrastructure in the closets. Um, the closets are secured. But when we move into an Internet of Things world, this problem is just going to multiply. Right? What happens when the light switches have IP addresses? And who knows? My shoes have IP addresses. and It's, it's going to get crazy. So how do we deal with that? And frankly, I don't have an answer quite yet. Um, many companies say they do, and they'll make you spend a lot of money on solutions. But one of them I can think of is maybe we map access policy down to devices based on 802.1x. So when, when I authenticate or my device authenticates, it pulls down the thermostat policy so that it can coexist on the same network and yet not be wide open to the world as, say, um, my laptop is. So with that, I realize we're over, but are there any questions? Yes. So there was one point you skipped over a couple of seconds. Oh, sure. How does firewall? Oh, I'm sorry. Where was this? I'm curious. <laughs> oh, I'll never see you guys. I swear it wasn't intentional. Oh, yeah, coming soon. So this is, uh, do you want to talk about it or shall I? Yeah, so I'll talk real quick. I mean, um, one of the things we realized is kind of what David said is that um, kind of your default posture for things, you know, you get a Linux box out of the, you know, install today, you know, you have IP tables kind of by default, you install a Windows machine, you have, you know, Windows host firewalls. One of the things we look at is, you know, you have this Internet of Things and this, you know, fast variety of devices on MIT net is having a more secure posture by default. So that devices by default may not necessarily be exposed to the entire public network. And there are legitimate reasons people want to have a device on the public network, and that's fine. You know, one of the things that's great about MIT is if, if, we, if people want to do that, you allow them to do that. You know, they can do that in an automated way. They can do that by themselves. They don't need to ask a policy person. They don't need to do anything like that. So what we're trying to move towards is really a, um, a network topology where, by default, people will be behind some layer of protection. If they want to go to a web page and enroll themselves you know, in the public internet uh, level of access, they can do that without talking to anyone, and it's automated. And it just, you know, happens, you know, uh, within a minute or two. And uh, so I think what we're trying to do is just move the default security posture to something a little bit more uh, secure by default. But at the same time, we recognize that, you know, our goal here 
is to not really disrupt the innovative activities that happen here. And so if people want to do that, students or faculty on an opt-in basis can go to the web page. That's up to them. Any other questions? Hmm? I don't know. Um, sure. Does the tra what's the traffic breakdown on the MIT network? In terms of like what kind of traffic do you see the most of? Yeah, so I mean, you know, looking at Stealthwatch, I'd say like 80% of our traffic, if you look at it by protocol, is like HTTP. You know, Which would include yeah. HTTP streamed media. Movies, yeah. media. Now, I think the interesting question you could ask is how much of it is legitimate research? <laughs> <laughs> I know you guys are all studying, huh? Uh, I know I was, and so I'm still working it. No. But, um, but uh, yeah, it's an interesting breakdown. I think the one thing we do philosophically um, as a provider is, you know, a lot of schools, there was a time where they were trying to make judgments about what kinds of traffic and how much we're going across their campus networks. MIT does not do that. You know, one thing we believe very strongly in is not me nor anybody else, you know, in the administration is in a position to pass value judgment over someone's internet activities. Because yeah. people live here. Live it's, here, it's right? not just your work. I mean, people are doing a lot of research on Netflix because we have a Netflix cache and we have a lot of traffic going there. But we also have thousands of students and staff living here. So that's them at night, you know, powering up their, their Netflix box and streaming or whatever it may be. So we've always been in the position of like, you know, we have some very detailed information about what it is, but I'd say the most of it is, um, I'd say even nowadays it's kind of scary. I'd say at night half of it's video streaming, which is... Do you see a lot of porn traffic? Porn? We don't, we don't no. Oh. oh, you know what's interesting? <laughs> so porn, porn and torrents are pretty similar, so yeah. Um, not that that's what went through my head Freudian-wise, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's interesting, Tor torrent traffic has actually gone down. I think that's what, what's been interesting. I'd say it's actually gone down over the years. Um, I think people, I think on the plus side, most things are getting so easy for people to get yeah. through something like a Netflix or an Amazon Prime or whatever it is, where you can subscribe for $4 a month, where people are generally doing it. Uh, we have a Comcast video TV service we offer kind of uh, for free, you know, as a student. So if you want to do IPTV, you can kind of just do it on your computer now. But for the most part, we've seen, I've seen torrents have actually gone down, mm -hmm. I, would, I would just be honest, which is kind of a surprise. All right, well, let's thank uh, David Mark. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you.